get into it tonight. I'm ready to go. I hope that you came uh, ready. I, I don't know what point some of you are, are probably in college right now. You're taking classes. I don't know what point in the semester you're in. Maybe you had a stressful day. Maybe you've got a lot of tests. Maybe you've got papers due. Here's what I'm asking. I'm asking that for the next few moments, you lean in. I, I feel like I have a word that will help, and my heart up here tonight is simply to be helpful. And um, there's something that is, that is burning in me to, to get across to you tonight. So hopefully uh, you brought a notebook, hopefully you brought a Bible. Uh, I think there's something about whether you're looking at it electronically or you're looking at it in a paper Bible, however you get down, I, I would encourage you to look at these verses and read them for yourself. Whether you use an electronic or a paper Bible, it, there's something about you putting your eyes on scripture and seeing it for yourself and highlighting it and making notes by it. There's just something about that. I want to welcome all those who are watching online with us. We love our online family and uh, we're excited that you're with us. But I want to talk to you tonight about being led by the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit. One of the most important things that we can learn to do as followers of Jesus is be led by the Spirit. And I believe this. I heard someone say this a long time ago, and I believe it to be true. The answer to a million one questions is to be led by the Spirit of God. In fact, in the book of Romans, that's not going to be on the screen, but I want you to jot this down. In Romans 8, 14, it says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of of God. So the Bible's clear that we as sons and daughters of God, if you're a Jesus follower in this place or watching online, that we are to be led by his spirit. And so I want to I want to just talk tonight about what the Holy Spirit does in our lives, how he leads us in our lives, but I also want to hit it from a little bit of a different angle. Things that hinder us, ways that we're hindered from being led by the Spirit of God. Because here's what I'm finding. There's a lot of hindrances towards being led by the Spirit, and there's a lot of things out there confusing people and causing things to be really cloudy, sometimes really mystical and magical, but people are being led astray. They're, they're getting confused. Here's what I found to be true, that the Holy Spirit isn't the author of confusion. He's the author of, of clarity. If you're in here and you're confused, you're in the right place because I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to bring you clarity tonight. So in John chapter 16, verse 13, we're gonna pick up there. A little backstory. In John 14, Jesus is talking with his disciples and he basically tells them, hey, I'm gonna be leaving, but I'm gonna send you another comforter, a parakletos, one who is just like me. He's going he's gonna to remind you of things. He's going to lead you into the truth of what I want you to do. He's going to lead you in the way that the Father wants you to go. He's one that is just like me. Jesus actually said, it's better for you. It's expedient for you is what he said, that I go because I'm going to send you this, this another comforter this other comforter, this one who's just like me, who's gonna play that role in your lives. Think about this for a moment. The disciples were with Jesus, walking with him every day for like three years of Jesus' earthly ministry. They're with him every day. Jesus is telling those people, hey, it's actually better for you if I go because I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna leave you helpless I'm gonna send you another comforter. I'm gonna send you one who's just like me and he's gonna help you. He's gonna lead you. He's gonna guide you. So then we pick up in John 16, 13. It says, when the spirit of truth comes, Jesus talking again, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he'll tell you what he has heard and he will tell you about the future. So I believe that there's three things that we see here in John 16, 13 that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. He guides us into all truth. He speaks to you what he's heard from the Father. He's not speaking of himself. He's not speaking from himself. He's speaking what he's heard from the Father. And he shows us things to come in the future. He shows us about the future. He guides us into all truth. What truth is he guiding us into? He's guiding us into the truth of the word of God. In fact, anytime that the spirit of God leads you, he's always gonna lead you in the way of scripture. He's always gonna lead you in alignment with scripture, in obedience to scripture. 
When he speaks to you what he's heard from the Father, he's not going to give you some out there word. I've heard a lot of people get out there words and be like, the Holy Spirit was speaking through me. I have a prophecy for you. And I think, uh uh-oh, uh-oh. No, he's not going to speak on his own. He's going to say what the Father said, and he'll show you about the future. I've seen some things over the last few years of ministry that that have, have concerned me because here's my heart. I want to help people. I was taught really well. I have a great foundation in being led by the Spirit growing up in this church and hearing so many people that are mentors in my life show me this and embody this and do it. They're actually led by the Spirit of God. But what I see is I heard somebody say this a long time ago, somebody that I really respect. They said some people, they're so caught up and they're so obsessed with the spectacular that they miss out on the supernatural. And I, I, I think I know why, because sometimes we want the Spirit of God to lead us in really mystical and magical and big ways, but, but really, here's the thing, the supernatural doesn't happen like that. The supernatural usually happens as the result of small steps of obedience that seem insignificant in a moment, but make all the difference eternally. See, I've found in my life that sometimes the things that seem mundane, it seems like an insignificant step that God is able to do the supernatural through that step. If you want to see what it looks like in the Gospels to be led by the Spirit, look at the life of Jesus. Jesus was never doing anything that was weird. He was never doing anything that was out there. He wasn't changing directions constantly as far as the direction for his life, what he was called to do. He said, I'm here to do the will of him who sent me. And he was really clear on what that was. He knew, I'm going to go and I'm going I'm to preach the Gospel. I'm going to go and I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to go and I'm going to bring hope, help, and healing to people who need it. He knew why he was here. He was here to do God's mission for him on this earth. He never wavered on that. He didn't change it. He knew what he was called to do. A lot of the things that Jesus was called to do, they weren't spectacular things, but the supernatural happened as a result of his obedience. Some of the places that Jesus was called to go, you wouldn't have wanted to go, but when he got there because of his step of obedience, there were supernatural things that happened. We live in a culture right now that's obsessed with the spectacular. Give me something spectacular, magical, mystical, give me that. At the expense of actually what's what's supernatural. We want the Holy Spirit to lead us in the big thing, but we aren't allowing him to lead us into obedience in the small things. We want the Holy Spirit to speak to us a specific word, but we aren't allowing him to speak to us through the word. And I I just want to encourage you for a moment. This is encouraging. I just want to encourage you for a moment. I had to remind you guys, this is encouraging. Whenever you say that, it's like, this is kind of like going to step on your toes maybe a little. Don't expect to hear from the Spirit of God in the big thing that you want to hear about when you haven't done the small things that he's already asked you to do. Don't expect to. And I don't say that to be mean, but I say that because it's so true. We want God to lead us, God to appear to us. God, give me your plan for my life. It's like you haven't even taken the steps that I've already called you to take. It's obedience in the small things. I found that in my life, it's been obedience in a series of small things that then has led me, the Holy Spirit has been able to lead me, guide me, direct me as I'm being obedient in the small things to then the bigger things that he wants me to do. And usually the things that happen that people are like, oh, that's cool. It happened because of small obedience that that most people wouldn't have responded to. I was just talking to somebody I respect and they're like, you know, people don't think about this, but like when the Holy Spirit first started to deal with me, one time I remember I was going to throw a gum wrapper out of the trap or out of the car, roll the window down and throw the gum wrapper out. And I thought, ah, somebody else will get it. This is somebody that's a mentor in my life was talking. And uh, I said, I was about to throw that thing out the window. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit dealt with me. Don't throw that out the window. Don't litter. And he's like, I thought to myself like, No, I'm going to throw it out the window. Somebody will clean it up. 
but I sense like, don't do that. And he's like, so I took it and I put it in my pocket and I waited and I threw it away. That's a really small thing. But here's the thing. The small things, the things that are identified in the script in scripture, the things that are actually like things that the Bible says don't do, the things that the Bible says to do, we've got to pay attention to those things. Je- Jesus said all throughout scripture, hey, pay attention. The Bible says multiple times, pay attention. Incline your ear. Like bend your ear towards what I'm saying to you in scripture. Because we have to have a sensitivity to scripture. Here's what happens. When we aren't obedient in the small things, what happens is we sever our conscience and we become desensitized in the small things. And if you aren't faithful in the small things, God can't lead you the way he wants to in the big things. He needs your obedience in the small things. He needs your faithfulness in the small things. I want to speak to this for for just a moment because there's been an obsession with the spectacular. There's been this obsession with the spectacular. And one of the things that there's an obsession about is people want a word for them. And if we're not careful, we can can have prophecy out of its proper place. And before you throw your spiritual fruit at me, let me explain myself. Prophecy... In the Old Testament, prophecy was 100% necessary. You had to hear from the prophet of God the, the word of the Lord for you. New Testament, Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit. So when we accept the free gift of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us. He quickens us. He reminds us of of what God is saying to us or has said to us. And then he leads us into what God has for us in the future. We can hear from the Holy Spirit. But we've got to be clear to hear. That involves tuning out other voices. That involves tuning out voices that don't matter as much so that we can hear clearly. Some of you don't have clarity because you've been listening to too many voices. So prophets in the Old Testament, they had that function. Prophets in the New Testament, here's here's their role. Because they would love to tell you, some of them, what their role is. And any prophet that doesn't say this, that doesn't give this disclaimer, just throw it out the window. That's a bold statement, right? But throw it out the window. If they say, if they don't say, if this doesn't bear witness with you, or this doesn't line up with scripture, like just feel free to throw it out. Every person I've ever had prophesy something to me that's been legit has always said, hey, listen, if this doesn't bear witness with you, if this doesn't check out with the leadership that God's placed you under, just throw it out. Please check me on scripture and see if if this was accurate for you. If it doesn't bear witness, throw it out. Here's Here's what prophets today in the New Testament with us being led by the spirit, here's what they should do. It should confirm something that God's already spoken to you by his spirit. It should confirm It should encourage and it should edify. Confirm, encourage, and edify. That's what prophecy should do. If prophecy is telling you something new that you've never heard from God, shelve it. Am I saying it's all wrong? No, but don't base your life on that. Don't base your life on prophecy. It's so dangerous. I've seen people make life-altering decisions based on a prophecy. You've got the word of God. You've got the spirit of God on the inside of you, ready to quicken you, ready ready to lead, guide, and direct you. Tune into him. Shelve it. If it's not something he's dealt with you about already, just just shelve it. There are things that have been spoken over me that, that I've just put on the shelf. I've been like, I don't even know about that. I'm going to put that on the shelf. Did I make any life-altering decisions? Absolutely not. Did I even think about it 10 days later? No. Why? Because I know what God's called me to do. And sometimes those things can be a distraction really easily. Did you know if you are longing to hear a voice, the enemy will see to it that you hear a voice that is not the Spirit of God to get you off course, to get you confused, to get your vision clouded, and to stop you in your tracks from accomplishing what it is God's called you to do right now? If the enemy can't get you to compromise, he'll get you confused. He wants you to either compromise. Some of you are like, got me. 
It's okay. The Bible says confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful for that? But the other side of this is the confusion side. I, I've been around more people, more Christians that are completely confused in the last couple years. It, it's astounding to me. But it, but it comes, from, comes from all of these things. The Bible says that there are many voices. None of them are without significance. There are many voices. None of them are without significance. What does that mean? There are so many voices. There's no shortage of voices that will send you on the wrong path if you're not careful. There's no shortage of voices that won't get you going in the wrong direction if you aren't careful. We have to tune out all of the noise. We have to tune out all of the noise. We have to create space for God, his word, and the Holy Spirit to speak to us. He wants to speak to you. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. It might not look spectacular, but I guarantee it'll give you a small step. And we need to be a culture and a people and followers of Jesus who become, rather than obsessed with the spectacular, that we become obsessed with taking the small step that God's leading us into today. What is the small thing that you're dealing with me to do today? What's the tweak? What's the adjustment? Who do you want me to encourage? What do you want me to do today? Because a pattern of living a life led by the Spirit in the small things will help you to identify if he's trying to lead you in the big things. The problem is we want to not be led by the Spirit in anything else, but then lead me in the big thing. Lead me in the big thing. And we don't even know the Holy Spirit when he's speaking to us because we've been severed and desensitized to what he's saying in the small things. I'm telling you, if we create a pattern in our lives, if you will create a pattern in your lives of creating space and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and the small things, it will open you up and make you receptive to when he tells you the big things. It's a series of, of small things not just the big thing. I don't want to go too far into that, but here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads you by an inward witness. I've never heard an audible voice being led by the Spirit, but I have felt an inward witness. What do I mean by that? You just have a knowing on the inside. You have a knowing on the inside. And if you haven't been in the Word and you've had other voices being stronger in your life, don't just trust you. Make sure that you've built yourself up. See, we, we feed our flesh all week long and then we expect to hear and live out of the Spirit and it just doesn't happen that way. And I don't say that to be talked down to you. I'm just saying like when we're hearing so many other things that are depleting our spirit, no wonder we can't actually hear the Holy Spirit, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because we become desensitized. If you, can I, can I say that? If you listen to certain music and you get a little scratch, you might be doing better than you think. If you can't indulge in certain things without getting a little scratch on the inside, you might be doing better than you think. If you can't engage with certain people without being like, ah, I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be in this place, you might be doing better than you think. Let's not mistake, let's not mistake standards, godly character with religion. The enemy would love to blur those lines for you too. Anything that, anything that creates a boundary, it's religion. That's how you relationship will cause you to go way further than religion ever will. I don't love my wife. My wife doesn't love me because she has to. Thank God. She loves me because she wants to. And I didn't even have to write a rule book for it. She just does things because she loves me. And, and I don't have to, like, think about it. Your relationship with God, we are the bride of Christ. We don't do this because we have to, because we have a list of rules and regulations. We do this because we get to, because he first loved us, because he found us, because he saved us, because he raised us, because he put our feet on solid ground. That is why we do what we do. And grace has never lowered the standard. Grace raises the standard. It's a gentle tugging on your heart. That's how the Holy Spirit works. 
It's how he moves. It's a gentle tugging. It's an inward witness. You know that you have peace. And if not, you have a check. It, it, it's, it's subtle. It's not something that he's not going to overpower. The Holy Spirit is a, is a gentleman. He has to be invited. When's the last time you invited the Holy Spirit into your decision making? So I want to talk about, before I go too long on all of that, which I already have, I want to talk about four things that hinder us, four things that hinder us from being led by the Spirit. I don't want to be a person who is caught up in the spectacular and misses the supernatural. I want to be willing to pay attention to the small things daily that the Holy Spirit's dealing with me about that lead to the big things. It's the small things done with consistency. I've heard this leadership quote, the small things done with consistency that lead to the big results that everyone wants. And I believe it's the same way with being led by the Spirit. It's small things done with consistency that then you look at a lifetime and you're like, wow, God's using me in ways I never imagined. But it didn't just start here. I've seen people move change direction 16 times. I'm called to do this. I'm called, no, I'm called to do that. No, I'm called to be over here. No, I'm called to be over there. No, I'm called to do this. I'm called to do that. The Holy Spirit doesn't change his mind like that. Stop moving until you're clear to hear. Devote yourself to a devotion life and quit making moves. Start being obedient to scripture. It's easier for God to, to steer a moving car than, than a stagnant, stationary, parked car. So as you're moving, as you're doing what you know to do, God will lead you and guide you and steer you into things while you're doing what he's already asked you to do in his word. And I know I keep circling that, but I just feel like in this place, somebody needs to get that tonight. Because I don't just circle things usually for my health. Somebody's got to get that tonight. That it's the small things, man. It is the small things. Got to do the small things. Be led by the Spirit in the small things. Okay, four things that hinder you from being led. The first one is rushing into decisions. Rushing into decisions. We make decisions so quickly sometimes that we don't take the time to hear. Can I just encourage you to never make decisions based on pressure? but to only ever make decisions based on peace. I've found that any time <laughs> that I've made a rush decision, it's usually not the right decision. I heard someone say it this way, I'd rather be a couple steps behind God than get out ahead of God. I'm gonna make sure that I heard. It doesn't hurt you to even when you think you heard, to sit on it for a minute and just wait. Just wait, just pray it out. Bring other people in the equation. Don't rush decisions. Proverbs 21.5 in the message translation says careful planning puts you ahead in the long run. Hurry and scurry puts you further behind. See, the Holy Spirit isn't gonna lead you outside of the wisdom of God. He never will. The wisdom of God and the word of God are the same. And as we're looking into Proverbs, the book of wisdom, there's some wisdom here. In Proverbs 19.2, in the BSB translation. It says, even zeal is no good without knowledge. And he who hurries his footsteps misses the mark. Sometimes we hurry decisions because we think if we don't make a decision right now, we're gonna get behind. We're gonna miss out. Well, what about my trajectory of I want to be at this by 22 and at this by 24 and at this by 26? You might as well take that and find somewhere to put it. Like, just, just don't let that lead you. Don't let it lead you. You're laughing, but I'm being serious. I mean, I didn't say what all of you thought I was going to say, but... The person who hurries their footsteps, they, they miss the mark. I, I've seen people make so many quick decisions. I've literally seen people change states three times and say, God said so. One of the best things that you can do is just sit for a minute. And I think one, sometimes like just sitting in a local church and only having one pastor and one shepherd be the voice. Can I encourage you that online pastor is not your pastor? 
Whew, I, fe- I felt it with that one. Some of you were like, you will not. I will watch them on YouTube. Go ahead. Please just let your, let your pastor actually shepherd you because, because we, we need that. We need that. We need the care of shepherds. I don't need to hear more good messages and things that get me excited and emotional. We need, we need more shepherds. We need, 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 more, need more pastors that actually care for the flock, that actually will be in it with the sheep, that aren't about a YouTube platform that aren't about all of that stuff. We need pastors with pastors' hearts. We need them. We need them. If you're called to be a pastor online, man, step up. But pastoring looks like care, not drawing a crowd. I've seen people switch states three times, literally in the course of six months, because God led them there. The, the problem with that was every time they saw resistance or a challenge or anything like that, they assumed it wasn't God and they fled the scene. Don't assume because you face challenges that are challenges against your flesh that could create character that the Holy Spirit didn't lead you into that place. The Holy Spirit may have led you there, and if you keep moving, you're going to keep facing the same thing because wherever you go, you go, and that's what this person found. They moved three different states in six months, and everywhere they went, go figure. The same things accompanied them where they went. It didn't change with location. It didn't change with church. They didn't get the opportunity where they thought they were going to. but all of that could have been avoided. I saw this person, they were here, they were making progress. They were starting to live out God's plan for their life. They were starting to take steps towards being a follower of Jesus. And all of a sudden they're all over the map to the point where I can't even keep up with them. I have no idea what state they live in now. No idea. No idea. I just know they haven't made any progress. They haven't made any progress, why? Because progress happens planted in a local church. It's not my idea, it's God's idea. Some people, when you talk about church, of course you're gonna talk about church. You're a pastor. If I weren't a pastor, if I were a business leader, I would get up here and tell you about the importance of church. We have business leaders in our church that will tell you about the importance of church. Anyways, don't be in a hurry. See, careful planning puts you ahead. But hurry and scurry puts you further behind. What you think can actually put you ahead by your hustle can actually put you behind. That's why the Bible says to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he'll exalt you in due time. Due time isn't always when you want it to be. Due time isn't always when you think it should be. But due time always comes when God says you're ready. I didn't like that so much when I was in the harder stages of preparation time, which I still feel like I'm in preparation time. It hasn't stopped. Just to encourage some of you, it just hasn't stopped. But when I was in the harder seasons of preparation time, I was like, man, I just, (laughs) whoo, I'd love to get out of this place. But God was developing things in me. And what I needed to do was swallow my pride and humble myself in that place so that God could then use me and, and, and raise me up to do what he had called me to do. But that couldn't happen until I humbled myself. Some of you never stay in a place long enough to humble yourself. You switch jobs every six months. Can I encourage you? Just stay at a job. Like, stay there. Just stay. I, I made a decision when I was in Bible school. I don't care if somebody offers me more pay I don't care uh, when somebody looks at my resume, when they look at my uh, application, I want them to see that I stayed somewhere. Because if I stayed through multiple seasons, it shows that I stuck to it. And you can guarantee I dealt with difficult people. I dealt with all of those things, but I wanted to deal with those things and actually deal with them. I had people come and say, hey, we'll give you more money to come over to this restaurant. We'll pay you more per hour and you'll make more in tips. We'll give you the good sections. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. Thank you, I appreciate it, but I don't want to do that. I want to stay right here. I want to earn it here. I want to make it happen here. Some of you, every time something better happens and, and pray through it, I'm not saying, but, but I've seen some of you. I've seen two, every two months, every three months, you're like, man, I just feel like I'm not in the place God has me. Why? Faced a challenge. Somebody looked at me wrong. It's like, guys, come on. Like, we got to get a little bit thicker skin. 
Soft heart, sensitive hearts to God, thick skin towards people, and working through the difficulties. Like, have some longevity. Have some stick to about yourself to be able to stay in a place. Don't be so hurried to move around to different things. Don't be so hurried to make quick decisions. Some of you are like, man, I've got to figure it out. I've got to figure out God's call for my life. I've got to, ultimately, what does he want me to do? I've got to figure it out. I've got to figure it out. Can I just tell you to calm down? You've got plenty of time. Like, God's big enough that he can get you there. Like, he'll get you there. He'll redeem the time. He can get you in 15 minutes what could take you 15 years doing it your way. Like, follow him. That's the key in all of this. Follow him. The second thing is listening to the wrong people. Don't look at your neighbor right now. I'm kidding. <laughs> listening to the wrong people. Four things that hinder you from being led. The second one is, is listening to the wrong people. I love in Psalm 1, verses one through three, it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates in it day and night. The Bible goes on to say in verse four that he'll be like a tree that's planted. A tree that's planted. Everything that he does will be successful. There's something about not allowing yourself to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Be careful about who you take counsel for. Don't take counsel from people that aren't walking with God. Don't take counsel from people that God hasn't placed in your life as a, as a spiritual leader. Because there are a lot of people that are self-proclaimed spiritual leaders that aren't actually spiritual leaders. There are a lot of people that don't really care about you, but care about them and the word that they have for you more than they care about you. And I just encourage you, don't listen to those people. Delight yourself in the law of the Lord. You keep yourself there day and night. What does that do? That shows you what truth is. So then when you're confronted with a lie, you can identify it right away. I think one of the things that the enemy preys on is he, he's looking and he sees like, Jesus followers that don't actually know what scripture says. And with the mystical side, some of us want to hear voices. Can I encourage you, be careful with that. If you want to hear somebody, if you want a word from somebody, if you want to hear a voice, the enemy will see to it that you do. And if you're trying to hear all by yourself, a word, something weird, something deep and spiritual, you can get yourself into familiar spirits by trying to hear something. Stop being obsessed with hearing something. Stop being obsessed with getting a word from somebody. Don't be obsessed with that. Be obsessed with scripture. Be obsessed with the word of God. His word is a lamp to our feet. It's a light unto our path. In Proverbs 15, 22, it says, without consultation and wise advice. I use this translation, the Amplified, for this reason. Without consultation and wise, 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 wise advice. Wise advice. What's wise advice going to do? It's going to line up with the wisdom of Scripture. Wise advice. Not just advice, wise advice. Do you know the difference? Do you know the difference between advice and wise advice? Without that, plans are frustrated. But with many counselors, they are established and succeed. There's wisdom, the Bible says, in the counsel of many. Wise counsel. See, this is where I love that we do connect groups. I love that we do connect groups. I love that we have community like we do here at the U and here at Faith Family. I love that we have spiritual leadership. I love that God ordained that, not us. Like, I love that God ordained that. Some of you get offended with that. God ordained it. He put place the people in the positions that they're in. You don't have the right to judge them, have your opinion about them. You can do that. God's just not in it. Um, so if you want to side with God, stop. If you don't, then keep doing it. Um, but God appoints leaders. God appoints leaders. He appoints spiritual leaders that we're called to place ourselves under. There are some times where you'll disagree with the decision that a spiritual leader makes. I guarantee it. I told our team this at Fairlawn, team night. I was like, if I haven't done something you disagree with, I will. So let's fight for unity. They loved that one. They loved it. 
Not on purpose, but there's just certain things that when you change something or do something, it's gonna, somebody's not gonna like everything that you do. That's why alignment doesn't actually begin until agreement ends. Like you don't need an agreement to have alignment. Align yourself with the spiritual leaders that God's placed in your life. Use their wise counsel. God's placed you under them for a reason. I've, I, you can learn what to do and what not to do. You follow me around, you'll learn what to do, some of what to do and some of what not to do, you know? You can learn it all. But you can align yourself under leadership. I'm so thankful that God's called me to serve under Pastor Mike. That's looked different in different years. But by me aligning myself, submitting myself, going into him and checking big decisions with him, it's kept me protected. It's the protection of a shepherd that actually cares for you. It's important. We underestimate it, but it's important. The third thing is making emotionally driven decisions. Making emotionally driven decisions decisions. With listening to the wrong people, I want to say one more thing. If you don't, if you don't know the person and God hasn't placed the person in that position of leadership in your life, if they're not a spiritual leader in your life, you have to decide who actually has a voice and what you're going to just dismiss. Because there'll be no shortage of people that want to tell you what they think you should do. Be careful with that, man. Just be careful with it. As many are led by the Spirit of God. We've got to be led by the Spirit. And sometimes what a leader says will bear witness with our spirit. Sometimes we're listening to outside voices because we start to respect people outside that seem to have a gift, that seem to have charisma. We're attracted. Oh, man. You want to talk about the spectacular. Like, we are attracted to charisma like crazy. You got a little bit of charisma. You got a little bit of a gift. You can preach a little bit. Whoo. Making emotionally driven decisions. First John 2, 15 and through 17 says, do not love the world or the things in this world. You're like, how did you get to this? I don't know. <laughs> if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's a shouter. The message translation says it this way. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love, love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. The world and all of its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. There's something about this passage of scripture because the, it talks about the lust of the eyes. It talks about the lust of the flesh. And we immediately take that and think that we're talking about like the sexual side of things. You probably heard uh, purity messages, which, you know, we teach those here at the U and everybody, everybody loves those weeks. It's great. And uh, if there's a week that I feel like everybody is like just giving me dirty looks, it's that week. I have, I have some of you guys, like I forgive you, but you mean mug me during that, that talk. <laughs> I'm just going to say, you're looking at me like, why are you calling me out right now? Like, I got a good thing going. And it's just like, okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> um, lust of the eyes, lust of the eyes, <laughs> lust of the flesh. <laughs> Pause there for a minute. Lust of the flesh. Lust is just an uncontrollable desire. So you can have a lust of the eyes towards material things. You can have a lust of the eyes towards coveting something that someone else has. You can have a lust of the eyes towards material, where you want to get, what you want your life to look like, what you're seeing on social media. You can have uncontrollable desires based on that that cause you to live out a certain way or act a certain way. That can be a lust of the eyes. A lust of the flesh is anything that fulfills an uncontrollable desire that can Fill, that can fill and fulfill that compulsion of your flesh. So it could be success, 
It could be material things. It could be status. It could be being an influencer. It could be any of those things. And it says the pride of life. I love the way the message translation says. Wanting to appear important, wanting everything for yourself. See, the way you can tell if something's of you or of God is if it only, if it only affects you, it's probably just you. If it, if it would affect and benefit other people, then that dream is probably from God. Wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important. We, we, we're honest. If we all just like take a moment and are honest, we probably put too much, too much stock in wanting to be important and wanting people to think we're important, and wanting, and wanting, and wanting. And we allow our wanting for success, for status, for affirmation, for the ability to buy things, for materialistic things, for influence. We, we want, we want, we want, we want. And we allow that wanting to lead our decisions, to guide our decisions, to direct our decisions in certain ways that are unhealthy. Don't be emotionally driven. Don't be driven by fear of failure. Don't be driven by, by fear of not fitting in. Don't be, don't be driven or led by fear of things not working out. Don't be led by fear of not having any influence. The problem that I see in our, in, our, in our world right now, in our culture right now, is even as I'm saying this, some of you are having like a, like a there's this, this tug of war going on. There's this back and forth going on in your mind right now. Because you're thinking, well, I see a lot of Christian influencers that like are chasing what they want and what they want and what they want. So do I. So do I. You're not responsible for what anyone else does. I'm not responsible for what anyone else does. At the end of the day, I'm responsible for what I do. I'm responsible for knowing the motives of my heart, the intents of my heart. I'm responsible for knowing what is driving my decisions and leading my decisions. And here's what I know. If you allow your emotions to drive your decisions, they will take you places that you don't want to go. And they'll give you, they may give you what you want temporarily. But man, I want the things that count in eternity. I don't want the things that just gratify my flesh temporarily. I want the things that count in eternity. And I can only get that being led by the Spirit. Some of you, I want to make this more practical for you in this moment. Some of you, maybe you get upset at, at the job. Maybe you're offended by somebody at your job right now. Maybe somebody treated you wrong at the job. Don't make a permanent decision based on a temporary emotion. Don't make a permanent decision based on a temporary emotion. Like, allow God to help you through those things. Allow his spirit to give you peace, to help lead you in those moments, to help keep you in those moments. Don't allow fear of, of failure. I remember one of the biggest things that I dealt with, and I'm, I'm way out of time right now, but I'm gonna keep going. One of the things I dealt with more than anything is I dealt with fear of, of what if things don't work out? Like, what if, what if, what if, what if? The enemy loves to get you focused on the what ifs. Until I started to get my Bible out and start confessing things over my life and I'd overcome something and I'd be like, okay, what now? Like I started to get a chip on my shoulder. Like, okay, I answered your what if, so what now? What do you have now? Let's go. I wasn't gonna allow the what ifs to change my direction. I was gonna keep going in the same direction. Listen, guys, there were times where I had moments in God's presence that involved tears. There were times that I had moments in God's presence that involved frustration. There have been times that I've had moments in God's presence that have involved everything but happy emotions. But guess what? I came out declaring the goodness and the faithfulness of God. God isn't overwhelmed by your feelings. God wants to help you work through your feelings. And God isn't asking you to be a robot. 
not he understands he created you the way that he created you so that you would come to him with those things. I love reading about the Psalmist David, how he would come like, my life is ending, but I will praise you. It's like, I've done that so many times. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, that is great. It's great content. Read Psalms. Um, but no, honestly, don't allow your emotions to, uh, to drive your decisions. I, I think there's something about that, that wanting, that wanting, that wanting that can keep leading us. I know people that are driven, driven by the dollar. And I just think, what a cheap thing to live for. Like, what, what happens once you get it? Sometimes I think that some people that want to be really, 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 really rich, I think the best thing that could happen is that they could get all that money and they would realize it won't fulfill you. There's nothing that will fulfill you like doing the will of God for your life. There's nothing that will fulfill you like doing things his way. Whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. I want to be set for eternity. I, I don't really, the temporal things, God said, if I seek him first, seek his kingdom, seek his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, that all of the things that the world chases after, all the things that the world wants, all the things that the world spends all of its energy to get, that all of those things will be added to me if I seek him first. The Bible talks about so many times where the blessing of the Lord, one verse says the blessing of the Lord, it makes a person rich and he has no sorrow with it. See, when you get it your way by wanting and wanting and wanting and chasing and chasing and chasing, you can get it your way, but you'll bring sorrow with it. Yeah. Anyways, that's popular. Point number four, I'm gonna ask the band to come back up. I know that there are so many influencers in our world. I read a quote that, uh, that, that I thought was so good. It was talking about the ministry of, of Jesus. And I just think it was, it was so spot on. It said, there's absolutely nothing in the gospels that would remotely suggest Jesus was trying to prove himself or gain significance and approval from others. Jesus was many things, but he was never a performer. I thought that was so good when it comes to some of the things that we're led by, some of the emotions that we're led by, fear of not fitting in, fear of people not approving of us, fear of uh, just needing to have that affirmation and that approval and maybe not getting it from certain people. This sure doesn't sound like the social media society that we live in, and I wonder if Jesus would be completely different than what we think he would be like, and that may ruin a lot of your theology, but we'll go to point number four now. Not willing to hear what God has to say. Not willing to hear what God has to say. Not willing to hear what God has to say. For some of us in this room, maybe we don't want to hear what God has to say. And I think for most of you, you're here because you want to, but for some of you, I'm talking and you're like, man, I don't really want to hear what God has to say. Because I, I'm nervous if I did hear what God had to say that he would tell me something that I don't want to hear and then I would be responsible to do that. So I'd rather just not hear. And I just want to encourage you, I've been there before. I've been where you're at. There was a season in my life where I did not want to hear what God had to say to me because I knew that he was going to call me into ministry. I did not want to go into ministry. There wasn't even a small part of me at that time that wanted to go into ministry. I, I didn't want to. I wanted to go into business and I didn't want to go into ministry. But every time, literally every time I would lift my hands get into the presence of God, he started to deal with my heart. And so I remember literally, I'm standing in a service, Pastor Noah Nickel was speaking and he went back into a worship time. During worship time, I started to lift my hands. He was talking about, for such a time as this, you've been called, step up and take your place. I remember I lifted my hands and God started dealing with me. I put my hands back down. I was like, <laughs> doing that. God dealt with me the whole time, hands up or down. God was just dealing with me. And finally, finally, I was just like, okay, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I just, I just wanna please you. I had that moment with God in his presence. 
the crazy thing is the next few years of that journey would look like God completely transforming my heart towards people, towards ministry, to the point where now I can't imagine doing anything else. Then I couldn't imagine. When he first called me, I'm like, I cannot imagine doing ministry. For some of you, you've been tuning out the voice of God. You've been tuning out being led by the Spirit because you're nervous he might tell you that you may not need to be in the relationship that you're in. You're nervous that he might tell you that that maybe you don't need to keep doing the thing that you're doing, but maybe you need to reroute. Some of you don't want to hear him because you're nervous they'll tell you to keep doing the same thing and you want so desperately to move from it. Some of you, he's going to tell you that relationship, it's holding you back. It's pulling you down. It's causing you to compromise. You've got to give it up. You've got to surrender it. For some of you, you think that God is going to call you to do the last thing, the last thing that you feel like you'd ever want to do. And for those of you who maybe are in this place and maybe you've been kind of putting up that wall with God, man, I believe tonight's that night that he wants to to break through that wall. He wants you to go ahead and let that wall down. He wants you to go ahead and open up your hands to him, open-handed, open up your heart to him with an open heart and allow him to do work in you. Allow him to speak to you clearly. Allow him to direct you clearly. Some of you, you've been misguided. You've been allowing other voices in. And I believe he wants to speak clarity. He wants to give you clarity tonight. Hey, you're where you're you're supposed to be. Keep keep saying, there's somebody in here, you're about to make a move. God was never in that move. And tonight, he's going to deal with your heart and you're going to have that opportunity to override it or to go forward with it because it's what you want to do. It seems better to you. There's a way that seems right to man. Man, it's God's way. It's God's way. It's God's way that leads to success. Jesus said before he went into a a grouping of parables in, in Matthew 13, he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. I mentioned at the beginning of this message that the Bible says over and over, incline your ear, listen, pay attention. I believe that this next moment in the presence of God is gonna be about doing that. It's gonna be about getting quiet. It's gonna be about tuning everything out. Some of you are hungry right now. You're gonna tune out your feelings, your emotions, and you're gonna tune into God. You're gonna press in in this moment. You're gonna forget about who's to your right and to your left, and you're gonna tune into God in this next moment moment. Everything you do in this life, everything God calls you to do, it's a test. It's a test of your obedience. It's a test to see if you'll be faithful. It's a test to see if you'll say yes. And I guarantee you, if you'll say yes and you'll create a pattern of saying yes to God in the small things, you'll see him do supernatural things through you. Some of that might look like inviting a coworker to to, to church and they get saved. I can't think of a greater miracle, but we gloss over those ones. Some of you, it might be speaking a word of encouragement to somebody. It might seem small, but man, in eternity, it matters big. So if you'd stand to your feet, I wanna just take a moment. I asked the band tonight to do something a little different. I asked them to just play music. So they're just gonna play. What I want you to do is I want you to take a moment between you and God Say, Holy Spirit, I'm listening. I'm asking you to give me clarity. Maybe you have something specific in this moment that you need clarity on. I want you to ask him. Anybody, the Bible says, anybody who lacks wisdom, let him ask. I want you to ask him for wisdom. I want you to ask him for clarity in that. If you don't have anything specific, just be like, Holy Spirit, I ask you, lead me, guide me in this moment. What's on your heart for me to do in this moment? I I, I open my heart, I open myself up to you. A great question to ask yourself in this moment is what is the worst thing God could ask me to do? 
And am I willing to do it? Am I willing to do it? Am I willing to do whatever he asks me to do? As we stay in an attitude of worship, I want you all to just put your hands out like this. Just put your hands out like this, open-handed to God. Father, tonight, we're open-handed. We open our hearts to what you have for us. Holy Spirit, we ask you in these next moments in your presence to speak to us, to give us clarity. We've got to lift up those who have been confused in the room. And I thank you that you are the author of clarity, that you would bring clarity. We've got to thank you for those who are, who are questioning what they're called to do, that you would give them direction in this moment. God, for those who have been holding on to something, I thank you that they'd be given the boldness and the courage to let it go in this moment. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's just take a moment in the presence of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your presence. We stand in all of you, your majesty, your splendor. We worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Someone in here, you have a, a foot injury believe that God's healing that foot injury right now. Someone else, you've got something wrong with your rib. I don't know if it's dislocated or what, but I believe God's healing that right now in this moment. There's someone else in here that you have a scalp condition. I believe God's healing that scalp condition right now in his presence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Father. I want to give an invitation before we transition what we're doing. If you're in here and you've never accepted Jesus, you've never made him the Lord and Savior of your life, but you want to tonight, I believe that that's the first step, the first nudging that you get is the just the need, that there's a need for Jesus. I love the lyrics that we were just singing, that we come in empty-handed, but then we're made alive in him. The Bible is very clear that our condition before Jesus, before inviting him in, that we were dead in our sins. In fact, the wages of our sin was death, but Jesus took that death upon himself so that we could live life, live a Zoe life, an abundant life, a life full of the good things that he provided through his death, burial, and resurrection. If you're in here and you've never accepted the free gift of salvation, or you say, Josh, I've accepted Jesus, but since then I've walked away. I haven't been living my life right, but I wanna get things right tonight. I wanna make a fresh commitment to serve Jesus with everything that I've got. Or if you're in here and you're like, man, I, I'm saved, I'm good, I've accepted Jesus, but Josh, I know that there's more. Just believe that there's more. And I wanna know more about the Holy Spirit. In fact, I wanna be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the evidence of that will be speaking in other tongues. And I just wanna encourage you, it's not weird. In fact, if you wanna increase your sensitivity to the Spirit of God, pray in the Spirit. When you pray in the Spirit, you edify yourself. When you pray in the Spirit, you give thanks to God. When you pray in the Spirit, you increase your sensitivity. When you pray in the Spirit, you actually pray out secrets and mysteries, the Bible says. It's a prayer language between you and God. The enemy cannot understand it. It's some of the most effective praying that we could do. If that's you on either one of those three invitations, I'm gonna encourage you all across the room, looking all across the room right now, don't let this moment pass you by without making a decision. If that's you, you wanna be saved for the first time, you wanna rededicate your life or you wanna be filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna ask you to just lift your hand up all across this place. If that's you, you wanna be saved for the first time, say, I need Jesus. I wanna rededicate, I wanna make a fresh commitment. Or I wanna know more about the Holy Spirit. Thank you, I see that hand, thank you. Looking all across the room, thank you, I see that hand. That's awesome. If God's dealing with your heart, don't hesitate, don't wait. I'm gonna give it just another moment. If that's you, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't let this moment pass you by. If you feel God tugging on your heart, make sure you lift your hand up. 
And if you raised your hand in this place, or you know that you should have, let's all pray this prayer together as a family. Repeat after me. Father God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Jesus, I ask you, come into my heart, be my Lord and be my savior. I wanna serve you with everything I've got for the rest of my life. I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, everybody that agreed with it said, amen. Come on, can we hear it for everybody that made that decision? Well, hey, thank you so much. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, that's incredible. We believe that's the most important decision you're ever gonna make. So the Bible says when one person turns to God, all of heaven rejoices. So I believe they are throwing a party tonight. But do us a favor, text the word the you, that's one word, to the number 94,000, and we'd love to connect with you and help you on this journey of faith. And also, if you're tuned in tonight for the very first time, thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving up part of your day just to hang out with us. So just say thank you. We'd love to get a free Starbucks gift card in your hand just for tuning in. So text again the word the you, that's one word, to the number 94,000, and we'd love to get that free gift into your hands just for hanging out with us. And also, just a reminder that we'll be meeting live every single Wednesday night at 9.30 here in the building at the U. And also, we'll be posting our videos online Thursdays at 7 o'clock. Just in case maybe you can't make it out for health concerns or you're still uneasy about things, we want to keep you connected and keep you plugged in. So we love you guys. You guys have been incredible tonight, and we'll see you next week.